I'm Nathan, and welcome to Stories with a Twang. Today's episode is called Paint the Gallows Red by Catherine Tucker Wyndham from Jeffrey's latest 13 More Alabama Ghosts. Tonight, Era May Barfoot promised herself, I'm going to sleep in Grandma's big bed. The young girl shared a bedroom with her grandmother in the Barfoot's home in Troy, and though she did not mind sleeping on the day bed by the window, Era May welcomed the prospect of having the double bed all to herself while her grandmother was away on a visit. And perhaps Era May thought, by sleeping in that bed, she could find out why her grandmother so often rose at night, turned the drop light, it hung on a brown cord from the ceiling in the middle of the bedroom, on and off quickly, and then got back into bed. The few times Era May had asked her Irish grandmother about the light, she never gave a direct answer, just talked vaguely about bad dreams and seeing things and such. To give an evasive answer was not like her grandmother, Elizabeth Jane Smith Cone, and the evasiveness bothered Era May. It bothered her too that her grandmother became so solemn, almost hostile, when Era May tried to question her about her unusual behavior. Grandmother Cone, a stout woman, normally had a resounding, carefree chuckle that punctuated her conversations, but she did not chuckle when Era May asked about the light. Something in her grandmother's manner made Era May quit asking, but she still wondered. At bedtime that summer night in the early 1930s, Era May decided to sleep with her head at the foot of the bed so that she would be cooled by any breeze that might blow through the open window. At first, she tossed and tumbled from one side of the bed to the other, not from restlessness, but from the delightful luxury of having room to move about freely. Soon, however, she fell into a sound sleep. Later, Era May was never able to tell how long she had been asleep when she was awakened by the feeling that someone or something was in the room with her. She opened her eyes and stared straight into the face of a man whose blazing dark eyes burned a hole right in me. Era May fainted. When she aroused, the phantom visitor had disappeared. Era May moved back into her own bed by the window, lay awake and wondered until daylight came. The girl did not tell her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Eugene Monroe Barfoot, about the intruder. They, she felt, would not believe her and would likely punish her for telling a falsehood. It was her grandmother she wanted to talk to. So as soon as her grandmother returned from her overnight visit and the two of them were alone, Era May blurted out the account of her frightening experience. Her grandmother looked hard at Era May, and she responded, Yes, I have seen him too, many times. Then came the explanation of why the old woman often rose to turn on the light at night. When I turn on the light, he goes away, she said. I never wanted to talk about it, afraid your mama would think I'm crazy and old and might send me away. For five years, from about 1932 to 1937, those strange visitations continued, and for five years, grandmother and granddaughter kept their secret. Their sightings of the ghostly figure matched in every detail. He wore black pants and a white shirt was well-built, muscular as though he were accustomed to outdoor work, and had a high forehead and dark hair. But it was his eyes, those penetrating eyes that seared into the very soul that were so fearsome. His root never varied in all those years. Era May and her grandmother would hear him come from the living room, apparently from behind the piano, and fling open the French doors to the dining room. The gentle tinkling of the glasses on the buffet announced his passage. A board creaked, and a change in the steady hum of the electric refrigerator marked his progress. Then the door of their bedroom, the door was securely locked from the inside with a sliding bolt, would open, and he would stand at the foot of the big bed, not making a sound, just staring with those burning eyes. After a moment or two, how can such fearful time be measured? 
he would turn and retrace his steps. Arame and her grandmother would lie still and listen to the now familiar pattern of sounds. The refrigerator's altered hum, the tinkling glasses, and a squeaking board. The swinging French doors and the footsteps in the living room. Then, silence. As the years passed, the initial fear that Arame and her grandmother had experienced was gone, replaced by a fleeting sadness, a vague awareness of some deep disturbance that enveloped the restless spirit that stalked their home. They wondered, though they never found the proper words to phrase their thoughts, what torturous memories, what unrelenting shackles to the past doomed the figure to an endless enactment of his ritualistic behavior. Then, one night, the ghost changed his routine. Arame was about 16 years old. Her mother, after years of childlessness, had a baby. Mrs. Barfoot and the tiny baby were occupying the back bedroom, and Mr. Barfoot was sleeping in the guest room at the front of the house. He distributed cakes and cookies for the National Biscuit Company to stores throughout southeast Alabama, and he needed to sleep. On this particular night, the specter walked down the hall and entered Mrs. Barfoot's bedroom. When she saw the figure, Mrs. Barfoot shrieked with a piercing scream that aroused the household. The figure vanished instantly. By the time Mr. Barfoot, Mrs. Cone, and Ara May reached the room, the phantom had disappeared and Mrs. Barfoot was in hysterics. Mr. Barfoot, thinking his wife was nervous from the strain of caring for the baby, tried to discount her story of the ghostly man who had stood at the foot of her bed and had stared at her with burning eyes. Now, now, he said soothingly, it was nothing, just your imagination. You're worn out from seeing after the baby. It was nothing, don't be upset. But Mrs. Barfoot was not comforted by his reassurances. She knew what she had seen, and so did Arame and Mrs. Cone. When Mrs. Barfoot was calmer, they listened to her description of the tall, dark-haired man, and they said softly, Yes, we know. We've seen him too. Then the whole pent-up story of the ghostly visitations came pouring out. The fears, the apprehensions, the unanswered questions. Who is he? They asked repeatedly. Who is he? And why is he here? I don't know who he is. All I know is that I'm not going to stay here. I want to move. Now, Mrs. Barfoot declared. And they did. The Barfoot family moved from their rented house at 122 Orion Street in Troy to a farmhouse out in the country. Before they left, Mrs. Barfoot asked some of their neighbors, people who had lived in the neighborhood for a long time, about the history of the house, asked if any strange things had ever happened there. You mean you finally seen the ghost? One of the neighbors asked. We wondered why you had never asked about it. Everybody knows your house has been haunted for a long time. That's the ghost of a murderer. At least he was tried and convicted and hanged for the murder in that house. His name was Tom Johnson. You've heard about him, haven't you? There's even a song about him. So, from conversations with neighbors and from reading yellowed newspaper clippings, the Barfoot family pieced together the story of their ghost, the story of Thomas Johnson. Tom Johnson, they learned, was one of three men hanged in Troy on a bright March day in 1899. He and two accomplices, Richard Hale and Sam Rivers, were given death sentences for the murders of Mrs. R. A. Myers, and her widowed daughter-in-law, Mrs. Ida Myers. The elder Mrs. Myers, they heard, had continued to live at the family home in rural Pike County after the death of her husband. She was the mother of 15 children, some of whom lived nearby. In addition to running a three-horse farm, she operated a small store near her house. In late 1898, Mrs. Myers' daughter-in-law, Ida, was living with her occupying a bedroom across the wide hall from the bedroom where the elder Mrs. Myers slept. The two widows were congenial, were company for each other. John Cook, the 23-year-old hired man, slept in a shed room at the back of the house. Neighbors, including Mrs. Myers' son John, were awakened before dawn on December 17, 1898, by a brilliant glow in the dark sky and by the insistent clanging of a big farm bell. It's old Lady Myers' house, they exclaimed, and they hurried to the scene. 
Dan Cowart and the Forehand Boys were the first to arrive. They found Mrs. Ida Myers lying in the yard near the blazing house. She appeared to be dead. Mrs. Rachel Ann Myers, mortally wounded by blows from an axe, was begging someone to help put on her clothes. John Cook, bloody from wounds on his head, was wandering around the yard in a dazed condition. It was Cook, testimony at the trial revealed who rescued the two women from the burning house and who rang the bell to summon help. John Myers, when he arrived a few minutes later, hurried back home to get his wagon to move the victims to his house. When Myers returned, Tom Johnson and Richard Hale had joined the growing crowd in the yard, and they helped put the two women and Cook on a mattress in the wagon bed. Johnson went with them to John Myers' house when he washed the blood from Cook's wounds and tried to make the young man comfortable. Mrs. Ida Myers was dead and the family realized that Mrs. Rachel Ann Myers could not long survive the battering she had received. Meanwhile, Richard Hale had volunteered to ride into Banks to send a telegram to Sheriff Sam Reeves informing him of the vicious attacks on the occupants of the Myers' home and asking him to bring bloodhounds to the scene. Hale borrowed a horse from Cowart and used Sol Vickers' saddle for the ride into Banks. It was Tom Johnson who suggested sending for the bloodhounds, John Myers recalled. Johnson had been a constable in that beat and was familiar with procedures for dealing with crime. It was also Johnson who unloaded a wash pot and an egg crate from his wagon and went into Louisville with George Johnson, no kin, to get a coffin for Mrs. Ida Myers. He had, years before, brought the coffin for her husband, Elijah Myers, and John Myers wanted a coffin just like it for her. A few days later, Johnson brought a coffin for Mrs. Rachel Ann Myers. He helped put the corpse in the coffin and he put the lid on. At the graveyard, it was Johnson who removed the lid from the coffin, presumably so some of the mourners could take a final look at the deceased, and who put it securely back in place. Johnson and Hale helped fill the graves after first Miss Ida and then Miss Rachel Ann were buried, and Johnson and Hale helped mound the dirt on the fresh graves. The two men were as neighborly, as helpful, as concerned as two men could possibly be. On the day following the tragedy, a Sunday it was, Johnson even found occasion to hand over to John Myers some money he owed Mrs. Rachel Ann Myers for eggs he had sold for her in Union Springs. So the entire community was shocked several weeks later when Sheriff Sam Reeves arrested Tom Johnson and Richard Hale and charged them with the murders of the two women. Robbery, officers said, was the motive. The arrest followed a lengthy confession from a man, Sam Rivers, whom the sheriff had taken into custody for questioning. The sheriff became suspicious of Rivers, it was said, when he learned that Rivers had paid for purchases at a store with gold coins. Gold coins had reportedly been stolen from the Myers' home that night. During that questioning, Rivers confessed to being present when the Myers women were slain and the house set on fire, and he named Johnson and Hale as the men responsible for the crimes. He was forced at gunpoint, he said, to accompany the two men to the house. Rivers told of moving a bee gum beneath the rear window to gain entrance to the house, of hearing the sounds of two heavy blows from the bed where Cook was sleeping, of seeing the older Mrs. Myers being struck with an axe when she came to investigate the disturbance in Cook's room, of hearing Miss Ida Myers plead for her life as she was being axed down, of the rifling of trunks in search of money, and finally, of helping to pour kerosene on Cook's bed and on floors at other places in the house, of setting fire to the oil and of fleeing the scene. Johnson and Hale maintained their innocence and Johnson's wife, his mother, and his nine-year-old son, Charlie, confirmed their alibis. But the members of the jury believed the story Tom Rivers told. On February 24th, 1899, Johnson, Hale, and Rivers were found guilty of the murder charges. The date of their hangings was set for March 31st, 1899. So the crowds gathered in Troy on that final day in March 1899, coming by train, wagon, buggy, horseback, and on foot to watch the triple hangings. There was a somber feeling among the crowds, nothing of the carnival spirit that sometimes marks such events. 
They talked in hushed tones of the farewell visit paid Johnson by his wife and mother, and they told of how Hale had been baptized in jail by the Reverend J.D. Hall, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Spectators near the jail watched the procession leave the side entrance at 11 a.m. for the journey to the gallows. First came the detachment of the Troy Rifles, followed by the prisoners in a carriage driven by J.S. Carroll, with another group of the Troy Rifles behind the vehicle. Then came Sheriff Reeves and his staff, all on horseback with a carriage filled with friends of the men behind the lawmen. The Reverend J.D. Hall's buggy completed the procession. The gallows stood near the Troy City Cemetery, not far from the site of the house on Orion Street that Era Mae Barfoot and her family would occupy some 30 years later. The platform, with its paraphernalia of death, was enclosed by a plank fence, 16 feet high, built without cracks large enough to peep through. Prayers, hymns, and testimonials at the gallows marked the final moments of life for the three men. Somehow, the scene almost took on the feeling of a revival meeting. Sam Rivers was the first to mount the platform. He spoke for almost half an hour, proclaiming that God knew he had told the truth about the murders of the two women. After Rivers was pronounced dead and his body was removed, Helen Johnson mounted the stand together. Both men declared they were innocent. Hale, he wore a bunch of fresh violence on his lapel, warned the young men in the crowd of the danger of keeping bad company, and Johnson promised his friends to meet them in heaven. Several of the Myers men, sons of the murdered women, shook the hands of Hale and Johnson and wished them well. One of the men prayed for the souls of Johnson and Hale in a better world. Then it was over. It had been a long time since the ghost of Tom Johnson, if indeed that is who it was, stalked the home of Era Mae Barfoot, but she has never forgotten the sounds associated with his appearances, nor has she ever forgotten those burning, penetrating eyes. Every now and then, she plays and sings snatches of a folk song written about those hangings. Johnson said to the sheriff, paint my gallows red, paint my gallows red. Johnson said to the sheriff, paint my gallows red, so the whole Myers family will know I'm dead. There are other stanzas of the song, but the one about Johnson and the red gallows is sung the most often. And as she plays and sings, she still wonders, why did Tom Johnson's restless spirit come to their home? Was there something about her grandmother that reminded him of the elder Mrs. Myers? Did he come to prove that he would do the old woman no harm? Had someone closely connected with the murders occupied the home before the Barfoot family moved in? Did Tom Johnson have memories that pulled him back to the house on Orion Street? Why did he come? Why? All right, everyone, that's it for this week's story. I know there was a lot of names to keep up with, and I would highly suggest if you would like to for yourself to read the story. It is in Jeffrey's latest 13, More Alabama Ghosts. I also looked it up, and the house on Orion Street is still there in Troy. If you would like to learn more about this week's author, you can head on over to ktwindham.weebly.com. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them over to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. The show is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Stories with a Twang Podcast. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well. It could really help the show grow. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and until next time, remember that a little twang goes a long way.